Hey everyone, this is David Brown with the migration update for September 1st, 2023 from the Ashland Hawkwatch. Although some Hawkwatches start in August, I always think of September 1st as really the start of the fall Hawkwatching season. And I have returned for my seventh season as the counter at the Ashland Hawkwatch in Delaware. And let me first say that any opinions expressed in these videos are strictly my own and not those of my employers. This is just something I do for fun to show the photos that I took and hopefully teach you a little bit about raptor and bird identification. Many of you may have followed my Braddock Bay series where for the past two springs I've made daily videos from the Braddock Bay Hawkwatch. And I'm not sure what my plan is for this fall yet. Maybe not daily videos and I'll probably also be spending time on my days off which are Sundays and Mondays um, going to other places maybe down to Bombay Hook maybe to other hawk watches like Hawk Mountain. So as the season goes on, we'll just have to see what kind of a routine that I get into because doing daily videos is pretty difficult. All right, enough of me babbling, let's get to the good stuff. So you can see from the photo, it was a beautiful sunny day, uh, not a single cloud in the sky, which in hawk watching we call blue skies of death because it means that it's very, very difficult to spot the birds. If you have a cloud up in the sky, you're looking for a black dot against a white cloud. When you have a blue sky, everything just disappears. There's nothing for your eye to focus on. If you spot a bird, there's no landmarks to point out to get other people on it. So difficult day for hawk watching, but there was a light northeasterly wind and it was a really pleasant day. They came up and brought the sun canopy in the morning. So that was nice. We got to sit in the shade all day and the hawk watch looks like we never left it. And let me also point out our new hawk watching sign with raptor photos here they're all my photos and we have our landmarks along the bottom it's a really beautiful sign i hope you can come out and see it in person the staff at delaware nature society did a great job on it before starting the hawk watch this morning kim and i met up and did some warbling here we have a nice canada warbler not much of a necklace on this one but you can see that big white eye ring and just completely yellow underneath on the top side is completely gray with no wing bars here we have a pileated woodpecker and we know it's a male because of the red mustache here. And this bird was up in a tree just pounding away and there were wood chips flying everywhere. So pretty cool. When I got up to the hawk watch, this yellow warbler flew over and this is a species that migrates early. So you have to get them right at the beginning of the season. The first migrant raptors of the season were three American kestrels, two of which you see here that migrated through together in the morning. We had a small number of broad-winged hawks throughout the day. Here we have a juvenile, and I think all of the ones that I was able to tell today, they were all juveniles. I didn't see any adults. Again, broad-winged hawks are beautios, so they're in that same genus as red-tailed hawks and red-shouldered hawks, but broad wings are a bit smaller, so they do tighter circles. And the other thing that's distinctive about them is their wing tips look pointier because their wing tip is only made up of four feathers, one, two, three, four. So they don't have the rounded or squared off wings that the red tails and red shoulders show. Just a little bit more of a pointy wing tip, even in a soar. Here's a turkey vulture and vultures are really difficult to count at Ashland because we have a lot of turkey vultures and black vultures the whole season. And they go by, they come back, they go this way, they go that way. It's really hard to tell what's migrating and what's not. As we get into mid-October into November, we see big groups of turkey vultures that are obviously migrating. But early in the season like this, it's hard to know what to count and what not to. So sometimes we just ignore them at the beginning of the season, which may not be the best strategy, but it's just something that's really hard to judge compared to a place like Braddock Bay, where it's really obvious what's migrating, everything just following the shoreline. So when it comes to vultures, I'd much rather be at Braddock Bay, counting thousands of them on a good day and knowing that they're all migrants instead of looking at, you know, a couple dozen or even a couple hundred at Ashland wondering which ones to count and which ones not to. It just drives you crazy. Here's another American kestrel. So remember that kestrels are small falcons. We see those really pointed wing tips that's typical of falcons and kestrels usually look light underneath. And we know this one's a female because it has some vertical streaking on the breast. And also notice the distinctive facial pattern that kestrels show. And they have kind of a long really narrow tail as well. Here we have a hawk and let's look at the field marks that stand out. We see dark patagial bars and a belly band. So that makes this a 
red-tailed hawk. We know it's a juvenile because it does not have a dark trailing edge to the wing and it does not have the red tail. And when we're talking about juvenile raptors in the fall migration, we're talking about ones that were born this summer. So birds that are only a few months old. Ones that were born last summer have already begun to molt into either their adult plumage in the case of something like red-tailed hawks or into just an immature plumage for something like bald eagles. And speaking of bald eagles, here we have an immature. So you can see with the sun hitting it, the head looks bright white. Actually, it had some dark still in it. And we see that in the tail as well. It's a mix of white and black. And the same thing for the underside. It's mostly dark, mostly an adult-like appearance, but we do see a lot of white markings as well. So this is like a fourth year type bird. Give it another year or two and it'll be in full adult plumage. And for bald eagles, also take a look at the shape. We see a really big head that's very well balanced with the size of the tail. Later on in the season, we'll see golden eagles, and they have a much smaller head compared to the length of the tail. Here's a helicopter I had never seen before, N11PP, from the U.S. Park Police. Here we have another American kestrel. Again, notice that facial pattern. And we know this one's a male because of the dots on the underside, and we can also see some of the orange tail feathers. There was one period midday when we had something like four red-shouldered hawks, all of them adults that were flying together and going after each other a little bit. So here we see a typical adult red-shouldered hawk and the photo is a little grainy but you can see a lot of orange wash throughout the under wings as well as the breast. But the other thing that stands out is that black and white pattern to the wings. And here you can't see the tail real well but it's looks dark with thin white lines, like white lines on a chalkboard. And here's the top side of an adult red-shouldered hawk. Again, you have those eponymous red shoulders. Notice that tail that looks like a blackboard with thin white chalk lines on it, which is different than the tail of adult broad-winged hawks, which have much wider white bands. Looks like a wide, single white band compared to the multiple thin white bands of red shoulders. And this bird's a bit messy looking. It's molting. You can see a feather growing in here. You can see a couple other gaps in the wings where it's replacing feathers. And here's an underside view. Maybe the same bird. It's got its mouth open calling. And again, just a lot of orange on the underside and then that black and white patterning. And again, that really distinctive tail. And notice that unlike the red-tailed hawk, red-shouldered hawks do not have dark patagial bars. Here we have a bird that is a hawk in name only. This is a common night hawk. And for the next few weeks, they will be fairly common. Even during the daytime, we sometimes see them on a bright sunny day in the noontime hour. We had a couple of these night hawks flying around. We had two, and then we later had a third one. Um, but if you go out in the evening this time of year, um, after a cold front, you can see hundreds of them on a good night. So fairly common and something that's always fun to see. Uh, the one really distinctive field mark is the white on the wings here, but you don't even really need to see that. There's just nothing else that's the same size and shape and the way they fly. I guess the closest thing would be like a chimney swift, but chimney swifts are much smaller. Nighthawks are big and just have a really distinctive flight style. Here's another look at an adult red-shouldered hawk. Here's a field sparrow that was feeding under one of the benches and they're fairly distinctive. They have kind of a plain looking face and just the overall color tone of them is fairly unique compared to the other sparrows that we see. Here we have two different Budios. Let's see if we can identify them. So the bird on the left, the one in focus, we see that it does not have patagial bars and it's really pale underneath. It has some markings, but it's relatively plain. It doesn't have a belly band. And we see it's got relatively pointed wings. So this is actually a juvenile broad-winged hawk. If we compare that to the bird in the background, which is out of focus, but we can still see the important field marks, which are the dark patagial bars, the belly band, and we can age it based on the dark trailing edge to the wing and the red tail as an adult red-tailed hawk. And again, both of these species are in the Budio genus. So you can see they're a pretty similar shape. Here's another look at the juvenile broad-winged hawk. And one thing I want to point out is a lot of times when I'm talking about red-tailed hawks, I say that the adults have a dark trailing edge and the juveniles don't. And that's actually true for broad wings as well. But for me, a lot of juvenile broad wings do look like they show a dark trailing edge. It's not quite as bold as on the adults, but it does look 
like a dark trailing edge. So just be aware of that. that that's uh, we can tell obviously from the tail that this bird is not an adult. The adult broadwings have that really distinctive tail where it's a, a black tail with a what looks like a wide white band near the tip. And they also have um, brown barring underneath compared to the thin vertical streaking like we see here. And again, this bird's on the more lightly marked end of the spectrum. So hardly any markings on the breast here and not very much here under the wing either. Some juvenile broadwings are a lot more heavily marked than this. So there's a good amount of variation. On a day like today, the birds can get up really high. So this was taken with my 400 millimeter telephoto lens. You can see here's a Boeing 787. And down here at the bottom, we see a migrating raptor. But can you tell what kind it is? Well, when we crop it and zoom in, we see a somewhat brownish looking raptor with pointy wings and a relatively long tail. So this was actually the first northern harrier of the season. We had two osprey today and osprey are more of an early season migrant. So it's common for us to see them in September in the highest numbers and then few into October and then as you get into November sometimes you'll get a stray late one but this is more of an early season bird fairly distinctive just uh, really bold contrasting black and white plumage they have long lanky wings that they tend to droop and they have kind of a distinctive patterning to the head with this black that goes through the eye and if we look at the top side of the bird we see a lot of white speckles here and these are actually the tips of feathers that are white and that indicates that this bird is a juvenile. Here we have a raptor gliding overhead. From the shape, we know that it's a budio. And looking, it looks like it has a belly band. We look, it looks like it has faint patagial bars. They don't show up real well in this photo, but I'd say they're there. Um, relatively light trailing edge to the wing and kind of a banded brown tail. This is a juvenile red-tailed hawk. Here we have a raptor that's tucked into a glide. See that its wingtips are folded back, so they look a little bit pointy, but actually if they were stretched out, they would look more rounded. We see this bird has a long tail, but it's folded shut, so it's hard to really see what the shape of the tip is. So just from the shape, we know that this is an occipiter. So we have three occipiters that are possible. Sharp-shinned hawk is the smallest, then Cooper's hawk, and then American goshawk. Again, they changed the name from Northern goshawk to American goshawk. That's a bird we wouldn't expect to see until later in the season and many years we don't see any at all. So this time of year, we're thinking either sharp hawk or Cooper's hawk. We know that Cooper's hawk is probably more common right now. Now looking at the shape of this bird overhead, it's really pushing its wrists forward. It's hard to see how big that head is. I would say in person, the impression was it was a relatively large headed bird. The tail looks relatively long. So we called this a Cooper's hawk. Now, if you want to dispute that and call it a sharpshin, go ahead from the photo and the distance. It's hard to say 100% sometimes. And you can always be forgiven for misidentifying an exhibitor. And that's especially true on the first day of the season when you're not really in the flow of seeing them yet and getting a good feel for them. So if you struggle with identifying Coopers and Sharpies, know that even the best of hawk watchers struggle, especially at the beginning of the season. So, you know, if you misidentify it, you misidentify it. It's not the end of the world. Um, don't let it keep you from having fun hawk watching. I feel like you go on some of these Facebook groups and they act like, you know, Sharpie versus Coop is like the biggest, most important thing ever. But I, I think most hawk watchers find it pretty boring. And, you know, you watch these birds, you get a good feel for them. You do the best you can to identify them and you move on. So that's the David Brown school of identifying exhibitors. Here we have another small compact Budio with somewhat pointed wingtips. One, two, three, four feathers making up the wingtip. So we see no dark patagial bars and very lightly marked underneath. See the trailing edge of the wing does look somewhat bold as we discussed earlier because this is another juvenile broad-winged hawk. And that one earlier, this was in the middle of the day and it looked like it was coming out of the trees and soaring around quite low. And then we had this one a little while later. I think it's a different bird because on the other one, I wasn't seeing this uh, messed up tail feather, um, although it might have just been more folded and harder to see. Um, but very similar to the other bird if it's not the same one. But again, just this uh, juvenile broadwinged hawk plumage is something to get used to. And we'll be seeing a lot of broadwings over the next few weeks, especially um, two to three weeks from now when we hit the peak of the season. 
um, when we can have hundreds or even thousands of broad-winged hawks in a day. And here's part of the group that came out today. A lot of people came out to say hello and do some hawk watching for this first day of the season. And again, we had such beautiful weather and in a few days it's going to get really hot near record temperatures up in the mid 90s. But to start it off, it was a nice cool day, a little bit of a northeast breeze to keep us cool. And the people are the best part of hawk watching. You know, you could go out and do this by yourself and yeah, it's kind of intellectually fun to be able to identify the birds and note, you know, okay, we saw a lot of these today or that was unusual to see. But being able to do it as part of a group and just getting to sit there for hours on end and chat with people, we have such a good time and um, hope you can come out and join us sometime at the Ashland Hawk Watch or at some other Hawk Watch. We take a quick look at the eBird checklist today had 61 species between the parking lot and then the hawk watch. And taking a look at the hawk count report, today's totals were two osprey, two bald eagles, one northern harrier, one cooper's hawk, one red-shouldered hawk, nine broad-winged hawks, one red-tailed hawk, and seven American kestrel for a total of 24 migrating raptors. The next few days are looking sunny. Tomorrow the high is only 83 and it's going to be light to moderate southwest wind. Should be another nice day. Good thermals for raptors to be up and soaring around. Then after that it's going to be sunny but it's going to start to get really hot. 92 on Sunday, 95 on Monday, and I think Tuesday and Wednesday are also up in that range. So be careful, drink a lot of water, stay cool, and don't worry if you can't make it to the hawk watch because there probably won't be that much being early in the season and those hot unfavorable winds. From Lakeo Birds, this is David Brown. Thanks for watching.